It was the early 70s and most of the buildings and roads and developments in Las Vegas hadn't even been thought of. Neither had the building behind me, the Thomas and Mack Center. But in 1973, a group of citizens, boosters, and businessmen in Las Vegas decided they wanted to make Las Vegas a college basketball town. They thought it would help tourism. They thought it would help the community in general. So they went out and got a basketball coach. His name, Jerry Tarkania. Coaching was my whole life. I, I'm really amazed at how many players I've coached. I asked them what you want to major in, and they're not sure. I knew right from day one I wanted to be a coach. I didn't want to be anything else. And, and I think that helped me a lot. And in a town where there are many, many celebrities, he was one of the biggest. And in the entertainment capital of the world, Run Rebel Basketball was the greatest show in town. Athletes and entertainers used to come and occupy Gucci Row on that side of the court. And there was one man responsible for it all. This is Legends, Jerry Tarkani. Basketball is clearly his love. It's what he talks about, not only his players, but NBA players, guys he used to have. It's just something that uh, really consumes his world. He's very passionate about it, and he has a lot of great stories, and um, it's, it's what he's into. Coach Tark is first and foremost about winning basketball games, and uh, whatever it takes to do that in terms of commitment to his players and having a quality staff, uh, you know, he never lets anything about his ego get in the way of winning games. He's a gym rat, you know what I mean? You, you, you have a coach that, that turns into a gym rat and they think about basketball 24-7 and how they can uh, improve their team, improve their coaching, and never how, how their suit look. Now you got some, some coaches in whatever level that, you know, likes look good on the sideline. I do too, you know, but uh, Coach Tark was never that. So many people in uh, the world today are have facades. Jerry Tarkanian is all about basketball and his family and red wine and he's just a, a guy who doesn't put up any airs. Jerry's focus was almost always the same. It was on the next game, winning the next game and what we had to do to win the next game. He did so much for the game to not only change it with uh, their up-tempo style of offense, pressure defense, but also the way he was able put UNLV on the college basketball map. I mean, you gotta remember, UNLV was a very you know, small commuter school when Tarkanian came to Las Vegas in 1973. And uh, nobody knew who UNLV was or what it was. And uh, he's, he's fully responsible. He knew talent right off. He could go in the gym and look at a kid and could tell you that this kid's gonna be good, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of guys were X and O guys, a lot of guys were, but I think he could, he could pinpoint talent you know, when he walk in the gym and see him. Front court, Banks, Banks puts it up for three points, didn't get it, the rebound is off, taken by Patio, turn around, Banks from 17, no, rebound, Gilliam, score. They were looking to turn things around, both in football and in basketball. That was the same year that Ron Meyer came in, in basketball, uh, football rather, and uh, uh, Tark came in in basketball, and they uh, hired both coaches, and. They looked for a big turnaround and everything, and I think they expected a lot, uh, not really knowing what they were going to get. That first game, I think there's more pressure on him because of leaving Long Beach, uh, coming to Las Vegas, uh, first game. Just um, you know, he, I think he kind of felt the pressure more than the players did about you know getting that big contract and and uh, a beautiful home and, and uh, moving his family and everything else, you know, whether it was the right decision or not. And, um, you know, so at that time, I think it was affected him more than did the players. I'll never forget that. You know, I hadn't lost a game, lost a home game in 11 years. Five years of junior, uh, six years of junior college and five years at Long Beach, I never lost a home game. I come to Vegas, I never had a radio show. I come to Vegas, I got my first radio show ever. I, the place is packed, headlines, Tarkanian era begins, and we get beat. 
the very first game got canceled by radio show that night. <laughs> I'll never forget, he came by the scorer's table and says, tell Tark to shove the radio show up. And he walked out. We won our next six or seven and he put it back on and I've had it ever since. He did something I think that no other coach did and he got criticized by a lot of people for it and that was built through the junior college ranks. Take students at an academic institution like UNLV that had pretty low standards of getting it, of entrance and I think that's important. I think it's good you have to have those sort of schools. Not everybody can be a Stanford. Uh, not everybody can be Harvard. Uh, you know, somebody you've got to be able to appeal to a broad range of people. That's what state run institutions did and Tark was able to take the junior college players, the transfers, who he spotted, um, turn them into better players as a unit than you could ever imagine. Uh, he, he did it with motivation. He did it with, in two words, rebel pride. He opened up his arms to, to his players. Uh, I didn't have to make an appointment with him to see him. And, um, you know, it was just a, a, a nice relationship to have with somebody that you was gonna spend a certain amount of time within your life and was going to be somewhat instrumental in, in shaping you as a person and as a player. Great recruiting is the cornerstone, the foundation of any great program and his ability to sell his program, his ability to sell himself, his ability to just make parents, make student athletes feel at ease, feel comfortable with what was going to happen if they came to his school, I think is a great lesson to be learned. He was known as Father Flanagan to a lot of people because he would take a lot of players from junior colleges, a lot of players from uh, really uh, impoverished parts of the country and bring them into this university and say, you know, we have an opportunity for you that you may not have gotten anywhere else. You've got all these kids that are from the inner cities that, that either don't have any parents or only have one parent that, that it may have had some problems off the court or in the classroom and they just felt life wasn't was against them and they, they had all these uphill battles and my dad would take him in and he would honestly and wholeheartedly care about their well-being you have to really feel it and and, and, and be honest about it because they can the players can particularly these inner city kids can, can always uh, point out a phony and my dad would always say that if you if you're phony to these kids or you try to BS them they're the greatest BSers ever. They're going to know that you are. You've got to really care. Jerry was able to go into the inner cities, connect with kids. The, the Sidney Green story is a classic uh, about how he hung outside Sid's high school in Brooklyn in a Cadillac, and everybody thought he was a narc. And because uh, there weren't too many white guys in Sid's neighborhood in uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn. And uh, Jerry was able to get Sid Green to commit to UNLV when uh, everybody thought he was going to stay in New York or to St. John's, maybe go upstate play at Syracuse. Through his motivation, uh, his expectancy on what he saw in my potential, um, by far the best coach that I ever had, um, uh, both on and off the basketball court. He could get a player to give his all. And, you know, the thing about him is he challenged whether it was by words or just saying, oh, you know, you, you can't do it. And, and that challenge, you know, to most competitors will make you want to prove to him, hey, I, I'm going to show you I can do it. And I, I know that's the way I was challenged. And, and it didn't take a lot to motivate me back then. So, you know, if, if I thought that he felt that I couldn't do the job, and I, I was out to prove to him that I could. And I think that's what happened with a lot of the players that came here. He really recruited me at saying, you're probably going to never start one game for me. He's the only coach who was recruiting me who ever said something that honest. He said, we need a big guy who's going to bang, make our number one players better every day. We need you to be a nine to fiver, someone who's going to really do everything we tell you to do and make this program a better program. And uh, I thought that was a very honest approach, brutally honest, to a kid who's been you know, a star player for most of his life. And uh, I figured if he told 11 other scholarship players the same honest approach to what their role was going to be, we'd be pretty successful because egos would be in check. Everybody would know what their role is coming into the program. And that's exactly what happened. There was times when, gosh, we could go and get a really good player. And you say, Mark, no, 
You know, we, we, you know, we need less. Less is more here. And the defining the roles and who the guys were and who the guys weren't was, uh, you know, was a big part of his magic. <laughs> His style of up-tempo was more of an organized chaos. People thought that we wasn't organized, but we, we worked our tails off to make sure we, we play together and were in sync with each other. Uh, but uh, uh, that up-tempo up style was exactly what I, you know, one of the main decisions why I wanted to play college basketball under his tutelage. Basketball is a game of habit. Whichever habit you create is the way you're going to play. And because of that, I never had more than one or two defenses. I usually only had one defense and maybe a second one for a little bit, but we did the same things over and over and over in practice to create the habit. And everything had to be intense. Everything was full speed intense. And I, I wanted guys intense. I know a lot of coaches want their guys loose. I never wanted my guys loose. I wanted their hands sweating. I wanted their knees shaking. I want their eyes bulging. I want them to feel like we're getting ready to go to war. I never wanted my guys relaxed. I had a transfer one year from USC, and he said, Coach, he says, uh, can we have some music in before the game? I had no talking in the locker room. I had total silence. He said, that no talking makes me nervous. I said, Earl, I said, it's no different in the summertime if some guy comes to your hometown and says, hey, I'm going to come over to your house at 2 o'clock, and I'm going to kick your butt. I said, what are you going to do? you going to turn the music on or are you going to get intense? To this day, I don't think he's been given the credit that he deserved for what he did in the changing of college basketball. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that when he first started in the business as a junior college coach, he ran a lot of zone defenses. And then he got to a point where he started getting into man-to-man, -man, and when he got to uh, become a Division I coach, he started using that. And the idea of pressure defense was something that he really uh, was, uh, I think, a forerunner uh, in that philosophy in college basketball, and he really used that to his advantage to get you know, turnovers and quick transition baskets. And the up-tempo style of college basketball, and even into the NBA that you see today, is attributable to what Jerry Tarkanian did as a coach uh, you know, 30, 35, 40 years ago. You know, he took a program that basically wasn't that well known at the time. They were called University of Nevada at Las Vegas, and even before that, Southern Nevada. But uh, he took a program and, and made the program go to UNLV, and we went to the Final Four my senior year, and by that time it was UNLV, and, and uh, put the run in, in UNLV and changed his total basketball coaching philosophy. And uh, so we became UNLV and we were the running rebels. And uh, that happened in a short period of four years at Tark, his first four years here. If you look back at the history of collegiate basketball, Coach Tarkanian, even prior to when he arrived here, but especially when he arrived here, we were playing uptick basketball both ends of the floor, 94 feet defensively and 94 feet offensively. No one was doing that, in, even in professional basketball at that time. So it was a style that we played. And many people said to me, how can you do that? How could we play that way? And I said, watch our practices. I don't know where the guy came up with some of these ideas, but when you start practice the first day of school, which is in late August, and you know the temperatures in Las Vegas are still in the triple digits, and you have uh, wanting to put on a 20 pound weight vest. Uh, this vest was full of sand, so it weighed 20 pounds. And we used to have to go out on the track and run and run and run and run, then go in the gym and run and run, then play, a little, then finally you'd see a basketball. And then, uh, you know, we'd be able to play basketball, but, but you were so tired by then you didn't even want to play basketball. But that's part of being in condition to be able to run up and down and score that many points and, and uh, being able to play that style. He used to always trust us in practice, your defense will start your offense. And if you didn't play defense, it was like you'd read about it in Life magazine because he would be all over you. And in a four hour practice, sometimes four and a half hour practice session, two to two and a half hours were just spent on defensive drills, uh, running the floor, doing a lot of running. If you missed something, everybody had to get on the line and run. I mean, it, it was something that you, you couldn't stand doing while you were in it, but when you were playing the game and you're down by 17 and a half, and all of a sudden you win the game by 10 or 12 or 15 points, you knew exactly why. Players are gonna work on their shooting. They're gonna get in the gym and work in their shooting.